Dundalk was getting ready, shopkeepers were fitting boards to their windows, nearly all were planning to stay closed. That was the advice of the local Chamber of Commerce. Advice that had been given despite the huge security influx of a thousand extra guardee. Detectives thought to be armed were posted on the roof of Dundalk's courthouse in an operation that began at exactly eight this morning. Barriers were put in place to keep back the crowds in the main street, and guardee prepared themselves for the violence that many had thought would happen at some stage during the day. A group of early loyalists argued with local men, and the guardee had to push everyone away from the courthouse. Ian Paisley and Peter Robinson then arrived by a side door, but many of their supporters were held back down the street outside. One group got into the town, but no further. There's a small group of Protestants still isolated up there. You're standing watching. The courthouse, lines of police were on duty, keeping back any demonstrators protesting during the case. The court was packed for the brief hearing, with Peter Robinson flanked by his wife Iris and by Ian Paisley. The prosecuting solicitor read out the charges, unlawful assembly, two assaults causing actual bodily harm, and malicious damage to a Garda car. He asked for an adjournment to have the case prepared fully, and Mr. Robinson's solicitor agreed to that, saying that the next hearing should be at Bally Bay on October the 2nd. He then asked for security outside the court to be improved, but the district justice said that wasn't his concern. Minutes later, Mr. Robinson was out and, at first, unable to do more than shout to the media. Later, he was let through and said he was angry at the security that had been provided. Then both he and Dr. Paisley sped off north. On the way in, their car had been kicked. On the way out, it was jeered. Their supporters were escorted back to their cars by Gardee in riot gear, not in the thousands that Dr. Paisley had called for, but a target nonetheless for local youths. Stones were thrown and many of the loyalists, huddled together and silent, held clothes over their heads to protect themselves, but not well enough for what was to come. <laughs> Two crates of petrol bombs were hurled from an upstairs window. Injuries were slight, though, among them David Calvert, determined to stand his ground while his colleagues wanted out. David, come on. We'll move and we're ready. We'll move and we're ready. Calvert, how did you sustain that injury? I, well, when, we, when the guard finally woke up, they then gave us some protection as we walked down the street in Dundalk, and the Republicans had their petrol bombs and their stones ready, and uh, a crate of petrol bombs came out of a uh, building on the one side. I was hit in the back of the head with either a stone or a petrol, a petrol bomb. I don't know which, but uh, we have now seen what the guard is prepared to do or not prepared to do. Gardi, armed with truncheons, tried to quell the local youths, moving in on anyone they thought had attacked the loyalists. Several were injured in the running battles that lasted in all about an hour. One youth was hit in the neck. His friends encouraged him to show what had happened to him. Meanwhile, the loyalists were trying to get out. Many didn't make it unscathed, losing windscreens and windows in their journey back north. At a news conference this afternoon, Ian Paisley said he would be making a formal protest to the Foreign Office about the attacks on loyalists in Dundalk. Peter Robinson said although he wanted to make another appearance in court, he would have to carefully consider his own personal safety before he made a final decision. Ian Webster now reports. The DUP team that escorted Peter Robinson to Dundalk showed newsmen injuries inflicted on one of their supporters by Republicans in the town. The damaged cars were also put on display. Ian Paisley said he'd be making a formal complaint to the British Foreign Office. Mr Paisley and Mr Robinson were accompanied by about 200 supporters when they arrived at the border this morning. Gardee stopped cars, searched them and received a number, uh, removed a number of items. Alan McCulloch was in Dundalk. There was an air of expectancy in Dundalk as they awaited the arrival of the Loyalist crowd. Shop fronts in the town were boarded up and the guardee mounted a full-scale security operation blocking the entrance to the courthouse from both sides. 
Peter Robinson, accompanied by his wife and the DUP leader, Mr Paisley, arrived in a convoy of cars flying Union Jacks and with a Garda escort. The court hearing lasted only a few minutes. Mr Robinson was flanked in court by his wife on one side and Mr Paisley on the other. They remained silent throughout the hearing. The state solicitor applied for a remand, saying that the file on the case had still to be completed and would be sent to the DPP for his final direction. Accordingly, Justice Aegon O'Reilly granted a remand on continuing bail to Bally Bay on October the 2nd. After the court hearing, they were besieged by waiting pressmen. Mr Robinson claimed that his car had been attacked entering Dundalk and said guard of protection was inadequate. The street violence broke out while the court was sitting and guardee say it was mostly due to local hooligan elements. The most serious incident was when a crate of petrol bombs was thrown from the upstairs window of an empty house out of the loyalist crowd below. Most of the trouble was concentrated in the Clanbrassel and Church Street areas of the town where Gardaí attempted to separate the rival factions. Of the six people arrested, all of them are said to be from south of the border. Three people were injured during the disturbances. As the Loyalists left Dundalk, Michael Renan asked one of them, DUP Assemblyman Jim Wells, why they had come. Yes, we came to observe Irish justice. We also came to show the people of Dundalk that we will not tolerate the Anglo-Irish agreement in any shape or form. So you came to stage a demonstration then, really? We, to, to stand outside the courthouse, the whole Ulster says no posters and banners. Yes, I suppose you could call it that. But we certainly were intended to be peaceful, which is certainly more than the girl intended to be. Weren't you provocative by displaying those posters yeah. down here? Well, then you can understand how provocative the Irish trickler is in the north of Ireland. On their return from Dundalk, the Loyalists stopped at Dramad Garda Station, where the items which had been taken from them several hours earlier were returned. A number of the Loyalists criticised the Gardaí, claiming that they had made no attempt to protect them from attacks by nationalists in Dundalk. They also said that several of their cars had been damaged. And a Gardaí officer actually tripped the young fellow up, and then he got beat up and got the face cut out of him. And then the young fellow was by the crowd that was standing up in the middle, the nationalists standing up at the middle. Then we went for our cars and started attacking the cars in the car park. And we were lucky enough to get on the bridge in Dundalk. The Loyalists then headed back towards the border. But when they reached the northern side at Killeen, they started to block the main Newry Road. They said they were waiting until all of their colleagues had left Dundalk safely. The IUC moved in and at one point there were minor scuffles as tempers...